Hi, and welcome back to Football Made Simple. 90 minutes of domination for Pep Guardiola against his former apprentice Arteta in Manchester City's 4-1 victory over Arsenal. That showed Pep Guardiola's tactical versatility as well as areas that Arsenal could improve in the future. But let's not waste any time and get straight into it, starting with City's tactics in possession. City had various ways to hurt Arsenal throughout the game, whether they were going long or short, and in this match we saw Pep Guardiola switch up his tactics. Where previously we've seen him use a shape that looked more like this, with a back three, a midfield box and a front three, today it was completely different, and instead the shape represented more of a traditional 4-2-3-1, with Gundogan being the second pivot alongside Rodri, whilst De Bruyne would move to attacking midfield so that the shape generally looked like this. And City were baiting Arsenal's press throughout the game, whether that was by forming a back three, with Edison being between Stones and Diaz, or more often, a genuine back two of just Stones and Diaz. So, where initially, it looked like the midfield was roughly man-to-man, -man, which we did see in certain moments during the build-up, what the City centre-backs were tasked with doing was holding onto the ball as long as possible, because with Jesus naturally pressing high, if Diaz in this example held onto the ball as long as he could, it would draw Odegaard out from the midfield and into the press, so that the Arsenal pressing shape now only had two men in central midfield. And that of course would be a problem because City had three. This created various ways that Pep could look to take advantage of Arteta's shape. Perhaps the most lethal way today was through the longer ball, because in this shape we could at times see Partey being drawn up onto the second pivot as he looked to back up the press, and what that would mean was that De Bruyne would potentially have space between the lines. Under pressure it would be more difficult to find a direct pass to De Bruyne, but what we could see is the centre back looked to go longer to Haaland, and what this would now mean is that if he was able to hold off the centre back and knock the ball down to the onrushing De Bruyne, the pair were now running at the back two of Gabriel and Holding, which could lead to situations where De Bruyne could create for Haaland, or in this match, Haaland was also excellent at creating for De Bruyne. In these situations, even if Odegaard's press was effectively covering Gundogan as the second pivot and Partey was operating deeper, when the ball was aerial and coming to Haaland, Partey would have his eyes on Haaland, and that would give De Bruyne the split second to make the run on his blind side, so that often he could then receive and now be goal side of Partey, again leading to the same situation where they were attacking the goal. Here we see that Odegaard is now pressing in the front two with Jesus, leaving Xhaka and Partey deeper, and in this case Partey is higher than he normally is. So when the long ball comes in, De Bruyne is free between the lines to potentially receive the knockdown, but in this case that doesn't happen. Same situation again, with Jesus and Odegaard being a front two, and this time as discussed, Edison is the third man in that build-up. Here Partey backs up the press and moves on to Gundogan, meaning that De Bruyne is between the lines. It doesn't work on this occasion, but we see that same principle, with the long ball from Diaz into Haaland, and De Bruyne looking to make the run in behind from the midfield region. But of course the best example of all of this is the goal. With those same principles of Jesus and Odegaard being baited into the press, freeing up the long ball into Haaland. And because both De Bruyne and Partey are turned around to see what Haaland will do, De Bruyne has more initiative and can look to make the run the blind side of Partey. De Bruyne receives the knockdown and is immediately running at the back too producing an excellent finish. But what was also interesting is that even during long ball situations, De Bruyne and Haaland showed a lot of versatility. And even if De Bruyne wasn't the higher man and was instead in the midfield, the principle could be the same with the chip ball into him, where he would then look to flick it onto the onrushing Haaland. And in fact, both De Bruyne and Haaland won three aerial duels with incredibly high percentage wins compared to the centre backs. But this is still Manchester City, so of course the short passing game was still vital. Again, the principle was still the same, with the centre back holding onto the ball as long as they could, so that Odegaard was forced into the press. What this would now mean is that Gundogan in this 
Example would be the free man, but because of Odegaard's cover shadow, it would be difficult to find him immediately. So what we would see in these situations is the ball into Rodri as they had a lot of faith in their pivots even under pressure and he could then play it around the corner to Gundogan and just like that City had taken several men out of the game. So here to begin with we see a very rough man to man shape in the midfield. So Gundogan plays the ball backwards and Stones holds onto it as long as he can, drawing Odegaard towards the ball. This then opens up the diagonal pass into Rodri, and just like that, City have taken the forwards out of the press, and now have a 3 versus 2 against Arsenal's midfield. And of course, if Partey was looking to push higher up to stop this wall pass from Manchester City, this would still leave De Bruyne as the third man, and he could look for spaces not just between the lines, but also in the half space as the third man to receive the ball from deeper. So again, initially man to man, with all three City midfielders covered, the pass into Diaz draws Odegaard, so now all of a sudden, Partey has two men to cover, with De Bruyne as the third man in the midfield being potentially free. But let's focus more on the role of De Bruyne. What we saw was that a lot of the times, Partey would be remaining deeper, knowing the threat of the man between the lines. However, he tended to be more focused on protecting the centre of the pitch, rather than drifting with De Bruyne wherever he went. And of course, De Bruyne immediately identified the spaces. So, he was often looking into the half spaces during these early build-up phases, as he knew at times Partey would not track him. And this would naturally mean one of the centre-backs, either Holding or Gabriel, would be drawn higher up if they were looking to even up matters in these situations. This led to several problems of course, because now if a longer ball did come, Haaland was in a 1 vs 1 situation. But what it also meant is that now there was a gaping hole in the defence, and we all know about Haaland's pace, so there was the potential for the ball flicked around the corner for Haaland to then run onto. So here we see with Partey being dragged up, as well as Xhaka, De Bruyne's position between the lines has drawn Gabriel higher up the pitch, which created a potential gap for him to attack but he's not found. What this led to is that a lot of the times when De Bruyne was able to receive in these 1 vs 1 positions against Holding, Holding was forced to commit the foul in order to stop this potential progression. So while of course there was the potential for Partey at times to drift wider with De Bruyne in these regions, allowing Holding to remain deeper and create a more 2 vs 1 situation against Haaland, what this would mean is that there could at times be a massive gap in the centre of the pitch. And one aspect of Haaland's game that we've seen coming on throughout the season is his holding play, and City could look to find him in these situations, and again, the running power of the likes of De Bruyne would then come into play. Here we have another example, again, with Xhaka and Odegaard higher on Rodri and Gundogan, and in this case, out of screen, Partey is on De Bruyne. So Partey on De Bruyne meant that there was a big space in this midfield region for Haaland to drop into, and though Arsenal win the ball on this occasion, the danger is evident. This space could also be taken advantage of, as Walker could move higher at times, and this would free up Bernardo to potentially find these spaces in the midfield. But the key for City in possession was drawing Odegaard high to create the 3 vs 2 and give De Bruyne ultimate freedom. And now we'll just quickly touch on what Arsenal did in possession in some phases, and how City was able to counteract them. Once again, it was interesting to see Pep switch up his system, as what we do see at times when he defends in this manner is Grealish having the responsibility of pressing from out to in on one of the centre-backs, allowing the centre to have more protection potentially, by allowing De Bruyne to remain in the midfield. However, City were aware of the dangers of the flanks, so they did not want to risk this potential overload in the wide region against Akanji who was playing out of position. So, Grealish tended to stay wide and only press if it was Ben White that was on the ball. In fact, one of the few dangerous situations that Arsenal got into came when Holding was able to drive up the pitch and draw Grealish. And with White overlapping, Saka could now drop into the midfield and find White wider than him, meaning there was a 2 vs 1 against Akanji. So, Grealish defended in this position for the most part, meaning that Haaland, was joined by De Bruyne in the press. 
And in the first half, we would see Zinchenko operating in the double pivot alongside Partey, and Bernardo could look to drift in at times to cover the second pivot, or drop much deeper, allowing Walker to potentially look after the man in the half space. And if Bernardo was more central, Xhaka would then look to drop out left to try and receive the ball in some space. But with the central progression being more difficult, because City were looking after the double pivot, Arsenal began to rush their play somewhat. So instead of building up short, it was clear that their game plan was to isolate Saka against Akanji. But rather than build up, they would immediately look to go long to Saka against Akanji. And of course, unless the ball was perfect, it led to an aerial duel, which of course Akanji would win most of the time. It's also interesting to note that playing Akanji at left back may actually have been beneficial in the 1v1, as it meant that if Saka cut in onto his strong foot on the left, Akanji would also be defending on his strong right foot. City had a little more luck getting between the lines in the second half, and that's because Zinchenko operated as a more traditional left back, pushing high and wide early, and with this 2 versus 2 in the midfield, the winger, whether Martinelli or Trossard later on, would drift into the central regions looking to receive from the centre backs. However, they weren't able to make much of these situations. Overall, this match showed City's experience in big matches, as well as Pep Guardiola's elite problem solving, seamlessly dealing with Ake's injury and changing formation when in possession. And this win now makes City favourites to win the league. But Arsenal will hold on to hope that maybe a perfect run to the end of the season could give them an outside shot. For the manager tactical scores, this was close to perfection from Manchester City, executing their plan over 90 minutes, meaning that Pep Guardiola earns a 9.5. And Arteta was not poor per se, but there was a gulf in class, meaning he only earns a 4. Drop your ratings down below. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, you might enjoy the content available on my Patreon. Not only does Patreon help to support the continued production of content, as I am a one-man team, but it also gives you early access to videos that will come on the channel. You'll also get exclusive videos, get to vote on polls, and so much more. And it's cheaper than ever, no longer having a tier system, so everyone on the Patreon gets access to all the content. So head over to patreon.com slash footballmadesimple to check it out. But that's all for today and remember, keep it simple.